if you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand, and uh, we'll get into the Gospel of Matthew again. Matthew 10. Matthew chapter 10. Um, actually, if you wouldn't mind, stand with me, and we're going to read the ch whole chapter. I'm going to read the whole chapter out. <laughs> it's, uh, Lord willing, we'll, we'll go through this whole chapter today, verse by verse. And Matthew chapter 10. When he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now, the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus and Labaeus, whose surname was Thaddeus. Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of, Samar of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold gold, nor silver, nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. Now, whatever city or town you enter, inquire who it, uh, in it is worthy, and stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Now, brother will deliver up a brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For surely I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, and hidden that will not be known. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light, and whatever you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. 
He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. You may be seated. Lord, we thank you for your word. It's a tremendous challenge to think about the cost of following you. And we pray, God, that you would illuminate our hearts by the truths of your word, by your spirit. I pray that you would overlook my inadequacy as a man and provide that gift of teaching and proclaiming the good news. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would clear out things in our lives that don't belong there and that we would be truly wholehearted for you. Lord, we understand that we need much grace and we need much mercy. And you provide all of that and more. Amen. Help us to see you and see you more clearly today. And to be encouraged, edified, blessed, and to be those who are willing to go out boldly proclaiming your name. That we love you because you first loved us. Lord, we don't want to be ashamed of you. We don't want to hide the fact that you are so wonderful and that you have provided eternal life for us freely. Why would we be ashamed of that, Lord? Let us boldly proclaim you and love you with all our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I had us read that whole chapter together in part because it's, it's a very difficult chapter and it all fits as a cohesive unit. Uh, it's full of very hard sayings and violent ones at that. Jesus is commissioning his disciples. Back in chapter 9, verse 37, Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers or the workers for that harvest, they are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. I appreciated watching uh, the videos and listening to Aidan share about going to the Philippines, so the adventures, and then just open doors to share the gospel. Aidan was simply available. He made himself available, and the Lord used him out there. And God is looking for available lives now. Those who would follow him, those who would say yes to him, and those who would be available to his spirit working through your life. You don't become someone else. You are who you are, but in the spirit. Used mightily by the Lord in your context and wherever you go. And with even increasing numbers of population in the world, think about the need for laborers for the harvest. And so his heart of compassion goes out and sees many, and his desire is that there would be labors for that harvest. Now, Jesus called them disciples. A disciple is a learner. And in chapter 10, what we see is Jesus commissioning apostles. So from a disciple, a learner, to an apostle is being a learner and then a sent one. So you learn and then you go and do. And now they are being sent as messengers. Apostles is the idea, messengers. And while the world wonders what it's going to do and it's all so lost, Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. He's not confused about it at all. There's a harvest to be had. There's a ton of broken lives out there that need rescuing, that need saving. And we have the message to give to them that they need to hear. We have the antidote for the venom, for the curse of sin. So the prayer is to send out laborers into the harvest. Who sends the laborers out? The Lord sends them out. But it's going to be a very difficult task. Why? Because the powers of this world do not align with the mission of Jesus. They are against it. And there's a lot of history and things to understand about that. It goes back to the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3, Deuteronomy 32. The nations were given over and a bunch of other locations. But ultimately, it's a spiritual war of kingdoms. The kingdom of darkness versus the kingdom of God. The kingdom of light. And been born, having been born again and knowing Jesus, you're in the kingdom of light. And you are really uh, an alien or a foreigner to this earth because your citizenship is in heaven. We've been born again. If you're a child of God, then 
That is your home. And we declare that plainly. You're not going to find a country on earth that this is, oh, this is it. This is my home. No, we go out into enemy territory, this earth, and we share the gospel. Why? Because of love. Because he loves people. Because people need to be set free. Because their lives are broken and there is no hope for them other than Jesus. But as the disciples are sent out in chapter 10 of Matthew, we see that they are ambassadors. They are emissaries. They are agents of a coming kingdom which will overthrow the kingdom of, kingdoms of this world and ultimately the kingdom of this world. And that it causes great conflict to go out with a contrary message than that of this world. So to go out, you will need the heart of Jesus. You will need to know his love. You will need to be born again and sent by him. You need compassion for people. You need to be able to see the mission. And you need to understand, basically, it's a rescue operation. If you'd like to think of it as a hospital, go ahead. If you'd like to think of it as a uh, military movement into foreign enemy soil, go ahead. But the, all the ideas fit. A farming, it fits. And so in Matthew chapter 10, he sends them out and commissions them as apostles. Verse 1, and when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power. First he calls them to him. You need to know the Lord. Spending time with the Lord, then you can be sent by the Lord. You can't be sent by the Lord if you don't know the Lord, if you haven't spent time with the Lord. It's so simple. And he gave them power. Where does the power come from? It comes from him. All true power. And having been under his authority, they're now given authority. It's delegated authority that he has given them. He gave them authority and power over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness, all kinds of disease. And so they had authority to help people. That's what they had authority to do. They had power to help people. Praise the Lord for that. It's not a uh, demonstration so that they can boast about who they are or build a big ministry so that they can make money or so that they can be famous. No, they've been given power so they can help broken lives. That's why God would give someone authority because they're faithful to do with that authority and power what God has called them to do, what he wants to do. If I were to send you on a job or a mission and you go and do that, but you're doing it for your own will and your own purposes, well, I don't, I don't want you to do that. You're sent to do a job in the name of the one sending you. And so they're going with his heart. And they're going with his power to do so. They're being sent out. And now he calls the 12 to himself. And they're named here. And notice how they're named in verses 2, 3, and 4. They're paired up. They're all paired. And you see that in Acts. You see that elsewhere. It's and, and, and. And so you see 12 names and 6 and. They're sent in pairs. He sends them together. And I think that's really important to understand that we're not alone in this. And that we need each other. That when we go, we go together. Because no, uh, no one's a lone ranger in this work, if you will. No one's, a, uh, no one's uh, Elijah. Aren't there any others? Yes, there are others, Elijah. We go together as the body, and we need to go, uh, that strength that we can get from each other. When one's uh, weak, another is, helps them up, and so forth. So they possess now this ability and capacity to heal people, to cast out evil spirits, and to bless people's lives that they did not have before. And they are going out together to accomplish his work. And the Lord does that. To accomplish his work, he gives you the equipping to do his will. In verse 5, it says that these... 12, Jesus sent out. And then the instruction's going to come in, which conclude, you know, goes through the, to the end of the chapter. But these 12 he sent out. Now I'll try to do this fast, and, and if I could draw it out for you, I will. You can just imagine I'm going to draw it with my hands, my body language here. Um, Genesis chapter 3, the fall in the Garden of Eden, the curse, right? So what did God promise? Man is cursed. The fruit is cursed, uh, the fruit of the womb that is. All your generations of mankind are now under the curse, under the fall. The earth is cursed, the kingdom of this world, the dominion has been handed over to the usurper. But God promised in Genesis 3.15 that there would be a seed, capital S, singular, that would come. 
from the womb of the woman that would crush the head of the serpent. And this promise, theologically known as the proto-evangel, the first evangelism, the first message of hope. It's a seed that will save. That's what this seed is. So this promise is right there at the beginning, that a Savior is going to come and rescue the world from this horrible curse. A Redeemer will come. We don't see this seed in this promise really being passed on until we get to Abraham. Until we get to Abraham. So we're looking at uh, 1,500 years later or so, uh, past Noah, past the flood, and so forth. And then Abraham, we're seeing this promise again, even though Sarah, his wife, is barren, that from him will come this seed, and from her will come this seed, this Savior that they desire and are looking for. So this promise, this covenant of God of this saving seed is given to Abraham. And Abraham gives it to his son Isaac. And Isaac gives it to Jacob. And Jacob gives it to his 12, the 12 sons to Joseph or the 12, yes, the 12 sons of Jacob. But then you don't see this promise being carried out from there. It just kind of disappears that a scepter shall be with Judah and so forth and this promise and this is the end of Genesis 50. So where did the promise go? Where did this covenant go? Well, they go down to Egypt and they're in the world, Egypt, and they're under the uh, slavery of the world and they're growing there and multiplying there and God gives Moses, the deliverer, and Moses uh, drawn from the water and there's a picture of the redemption in Christ with Passover and then baptism and then going into the wilderness and God providing for them there and so forth. But the law was given and the law is on a different line. So if you've got the Genesis 3 covenant, Abraham, the promise of the seed, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12, then you've got Moses, and that comes down here. And the law held them. The law kept their nation. The law kept their identity. The law also gave them proof that they needed a Savior, and that, they, that there was a sacrifice for sins coming, that there was a penalty for sins, and so forth, and it proved they're all sinners. So just prove that fact. And the prophets are involved with all of this too, pointing to the, the, the reality that God is going to provide a Messiah, a Savior, the seed. And they kept saying that. And then Israel would persecute and kill the prophets. And then uh, there, there's 400 years of silence. And then the seed comes. The seed comes. And then the seed does what? Is persecuted by Israel. And the law is fulfilled in this seed. And he sends out how many? Twelve. So what I'm just doing for you right now is I'm tying in this covenant promise from Genesis 3. You see it then in Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, twelve. Gone. Where is it? Prophets spoke about the Messiah. Finally, Messiah comes, the seed comes, and what's he do? He sends out 12. Reinstating, reinstituting the covenant promise that God had already given. That there would be a redeemer. So this new 12 go out with the message, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's doing it. God is doing it. He's at work. Israel is going to resist it to the point of killing their Messiah. The world is going to resist it. But this message has to go out. And so in the rest of the text of chapter 10, you see the work that he gives them. He gives them instruction on the work, verse 5 to 10, if you take notes. Then he tells them there's going to be great opposition to this work. To this message going out, it will be opposed. You ever seen that? You guys who share on the street, you share with your family members, it will be opposed. When I was first born again and I started sharing right away with people, did I get opposition? Yes. Did I see others come to life? Yes. Were some of those who opposed me at first, later on I find out they came to life? Praise the Lord. So there's going to be opposition, verse 11 through verse 26. And then verse 27 to the end, verse 42 of the chapter, God calls them to have boldness. You need boldness because there's going to be opposition when you go share the gospel. 
So Jesus is taking these 12, reinstating that covenant promise originally given of redemption, and he's giving them instruction right away. Verse 5, he says, don't go into the way of the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, the promises were first given to Israel. And uh, that witness is to be to them first, like Romans 1.16 says. They had become, though, just like the corrupt nations of the world. And they were supposed to be the light. They were supposed to be the blessing of all the nations. Abraham was promised that. I will bless you and make you a blessing. And through you, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. Well, through the Messiah, through this seed, this is how the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. A new nation, a spiritual house, a holy people, a royal priesthood, the bride of Christ, every believer in Christ, is how the nations are now blessed, truly. Drawn from all nations to be a special people, but first the message was to go to Israel as a witness to them. So, whom are you to go? Jesus sends the twelve. Go to Israel first, verse 7. And as you go, here's what you're going to say. So, who is verse 6? And what you're going to message you're going to bring and preach is verse 7, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why is the kingdom of heaven at hand it's right there that far away from your hand to you it's right there because the king of the kingdom is present Amen. where the king is there is his kingdom okay so if we're a body of believers who uh, are submitted to jesus the, the the kingdom of heaven is present now, the kingdom of heaven, though I don't see it downtown in the city of Victoria, I don't see the kingdom of heaven in the nation uh, on, a, on a level in Ottawa or Washington, D.C. or any of these other countries. The kingdom of heaven is heaven's kingdom. And thy will be done and thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And when the king comes, he brings his kingdom. And then it will be externally manifest everywhere because it will usher from his throne in Jerusalem and the increase of his government, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, will continue throughout the earth and we get to be agents in that, judiciaries in that awesome work in the millennial reign. Now, the kingdom of heaven is now but not yet. It's now because it's with his present church. The kingdom of heaven is present in his bride. Because we are from that kingdom in enemy soil, territory. So that, that is how the kingdom is now, but not yet. It is present, but not present in that sense. And so they are preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand to Israel. And Israel is going to, what, give their king a crown? Yeah, a crown of thorns they're going to give their king. They're going to give him a scepter. Yeah, they're going to give him a mocking one and a mocking robe and so forth. And, and they're going to abuse him brutally. They're rejecting their king. So the kingdom of heaven is, being, is going to be denied by them. But they're being sent to declare this kingdom of heaven in hostile territory. We need to understand that. So, uh, and today in this world, all who are saved, we, are a, we have a foretaste of that kingdom. There's joy in our life. There's hope in our life. There's the fruits of the Holy Spirit in our life. There's, there's healing of brokenness in our lives. That's a foretaste of the kingdom. It's beautiful. There's hope for individuals as we proclaim Christ for salvation from sin, for forgiveness. And there's hope for the world. And, and on the stage of the world, the world needs to hear this right now. They need to hear the message of the kingdom of heaven. I am very, I'm becoming increasingly convinced of this. And this is why I chose the book of Matthew for us to go through. Because the kingdom of heaven is recorded 50 times in this book. And the world needs to hear that. Because nationalism and globalism and all this ism is rising up everywhere. You think your hope is in any of this stuff? I hope not. I'm glad I heard you say no. Because if our hope is in any, politi any politician... By the way, if you're just center right, you're far right now. It's on a hot button, you know. And, and if you believe in anything biblical, you're, you're a traditionalist. You're backwards. You're opposing the kingdom of this world, at least in the West, you know. And if you believe anything biblical. And so there's going to be opposition. 
And yet, you can't look to any, any of these things. Oh, you know, but where's, where's Musk, Elon Musk in this scenario? Where's Trump in this scenario? Where's Geert Wilders in this scenario? Where's Biden? Like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We're looking for Jesus, Amen. our Savior. Hallelujah. We preach Jesus. Amen. There's no other gospel. There's, there's, it's not one gospel among many gospels. And we need to drop um, lesser than gospels. And if we're going to offend people for lesser than gospels and have them stumble over that so we can't present the gospel they really need, then we've done something foolish. We present the gospel of Jesus is what we present. And so they are presenting the kingdom of heaven. We have an opportunity to do that. And what I'm telling you is it's hope for an individual, but it's hope for the world. Nationally, corporately, there's a hope, a message of hope that we bring as the church. Verse 8, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely received, freely give. They've received life. They were outcasts, now they're not. They were sick, now they're not, and so forth. And they've seen Jesus do this, and they were given the ability to perform these miracles, and that would back the message of the gospel of the kingdom that they are preaching. So there's more instruction of the work, healing and delivering people. That's kingdom work. Healing and delivering lives and souls, sending to bring them freedom and liberty. Verse 9 and 10, more instruction. Uh, don't provide these things for yourself money and food and a staff and those things like that. A worker is worthy of his wages and, and per, depend upon the Lord. So as you go, you, you, it's his work and his provision. He provides for his laborers in the fields. So there's more instruction to go by faith. So they're sent by the king with a message of his kingdom. The seal of the king on the message that you bring. We are sent of the king, by the king, with the message from the king as emissaries to a world that needs to hear about his coming kingdom and the deliverance he has for people right now. It's amazing. And, and the means of the kingdom are provided as we walk by faith. So as you go into the hostile world, what should you expect? Well, verse 11 through 26, Jesus is giving a lot of forewarning to the sent ones, the apostles, sent ones, messengers, those who go out. So, verse 11, uh, it says, now whatever city or town you enter, inquire uh, of the houses and stay in a house. Hold as you go, and if the household is worthy, you, then you, your blessing or your peace comes upon it. If the household is like, no, we don't like you, get out of here, we don't like your message, then you take the blessing with you when you go. Yeah. You don't even take dust from that house when you depart that house. You're bringing the message of the kingdom, the message of Jesus. Some will receive, some will not receive. If people receive, guess what happens to their house? It becomes a house of peace and blessing. The blessing of God. I will bless you and you become a blessing. That's what's happening right here in this scene. I bless you, you get to become a blessing. And when you go into a house and they receive that blessing, then they've received that blessing. And they get peace with God. If they don't receive that blessing, then you take it with you. They don't receive it. They have the free will to reject it or receive it. And when you go, take that peace and that blessing with you. It's wonderful when people receive, but when they don't, don't take it personally. It's the king's message. Leave that house and take only peace with you when you go. Take your peace with you. Don't lose your peace because someone, you know, reviled you, didn't like you, kicked you out when you brought the gospel. Don't lose your peace. Take your peace with you when you go. Don't let anything else hang on to you and disturb your life from that scenario. When it was rejected, don't let the dust even cling to your feet. Amen. So some will receive and some won't. And when they don't, move on. You've got the peace of God in your life. No one can take it. Verse 16, 
Uh, here is what a word Jesus shares in verse 16. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Oh, I want to go. I want to send me. You know? What in the world? You know, I, I, when, you, when you read, just read it later again in this chapter, you'd be like, this is, this is terrible. This is hard. This is brutal. I send you out as sheep among wolves. He's forewarning them. Yeah. It doesn't sound like a good shepherd in this instance, but of course he's a very, very good shepherd. And it's a stark picture, though, of sheep going into a hostile world. So because it's going to be a sheep going into a, a midst of wolves, therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves or gentle as doves. Be wise. Be aware. Not everybody is going to like you. Be aware. And, you know, I, I've come to realize I don't have a doormat ministry. People treat me like a doormat, you know, and that's my ministry. That's not a ministry. No. Being a doormat. Jesus laid down his life, but he did it at the Father's will, not so people could just abuse him. He did it because of what Psalm 22 says and what Isaiah 53 says, that, that he was despised and rejected, and he took shame to the utmost. He took a cup of shame, and he drank it to the very bottom drop. And he didn't deserve any of that shame. We deserved it. Our sin deserved it. And yet he took it all on himself. The love of Christ compelled him. And he stood his ground. He didn't move from the Father's will. And so what I mean by not having a doormat ministry is really that it's not about people walking all over you, trampling on you and so forth. Yeah, someone slaps you on the one cheek, give them the other also. Someone asks for this, love them, give them that as well. But you have a ministry of being a messenger of the coming kingdom. That's the ministry. The ministry is being a messenger of the king, the work that he's done, taking first the crown of thorns and coming back with a crown of glory and power. So to make peace with the world who's at war with him. And we don't, we're not violent with the world. We bring a message of peace. But really the idea, sheep in a hostile world, being wise as a serpent, gentle as a dove, I take that and I think, oh, I need thicker skin and softer heart. That's what I need. I need to be wise. I need to be aware that... There's going to be people that don't like me. I can't get emotional all the time about it all. You know, you, you need, you, we need to be tough and we need to be smart. But inside, we need to be tender and loving. And what, what grace is there for that in Christ? Endless amounts. Some of us need to grow stronger on the outside, and some of us need to grow softer on the inside. And hopefully we can have both. So don't be naive. Some people will want to destroy you, sheep among wolves. Um, you know, need to be wise and tough. I, I like the idea of, of you know, a, a teddy bear, right? Well, who would actually take a bear to bed with them? You know, that's a crazy idea. But the idea is, though, there's a tough exterior, a soft interior, and a wonderful comfort. But... There's some wisdom there. Jesus gives his apostles. Verse 17 to 26. Uh, the idea here, people are going to definitely resist it. Beware of men. They're going to deliver you up to councils, scourge you in their synagogues. Looking forward to that. Uh, you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. It's going to go all over. Did this happen to Jesus? Absolutely. Did it happen afterwards to people like Peter and Paul and John the Apostle? Yes, 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 and through the centuries, yes, yes, yes. Oh, but not our, not our time. Not us. That doesn't apply to us, does it? Why not? We are an opposing world with a message from the king. And if you get the opportunity to go before councils, magistrates, governors, or whomever, then you have an opportunity to share the gospel. That's why you're there in the first place. First Peter tells us, don't let any of you be accused as an evildoer, actually doing wrong. 
don't go to court because you stole a car or did something else that was wrong, hurt somebody. If you go to court for sharing the gospel, for loving God and loving your neighbor, then go to court and tell them what you did. And, and let them be astounded and confused and fight against God if they want to. So it's an opportunity. People are going to resist the message that you bring. You will be brought before these for my sake. When they deliver you up, verse 19, do not worry about what you're going to say, what you should speak. It's going to be given to you in that hour what you should speak. And I, I only feel like, well, I've had this a few times. And I come to think of it. Uh, the first time I was, well, no, I'm sorry. I'm not going to even my whole life testimony here. That would take too long. But the first time that I was saved and brought before a judge, I gave my testimony. And I was brought before a judge because of things I did before I was saved. And which is why I gave my life to Jesus. And I, and I had to go before, I turned myself in. I was before a judge. And it's just coming out of me. I'm serious. I'm not like, here's what happened. And then this happened. And then that happened. And he paused the record, literally. Paused the recording. Stopped it. And he said, you're born again. And his name was Lieutenant Rock Tolve. I was in the U.S. military at the time. And he was born again. Amen. And he saw it. And he bore witness to it. And it was a testimony to him and so forth. And, and But he was already born again. It was a wonderful... So we had fellowship. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, it was awesome. And, you know, if we're brought before people, it was we were standing right here, and we had VHA, two members from VHA, and we had uh, the com community liaison of, of the Victoria Police Department. And they're questioning, why are you guys worshiping? Why are you guys open? Why are you guys here? What are you doing? You know, well, people need to sing for emotional healing. That's why we're singing. We're going to keep singing, you know, and so forth and talking to them. And, and uh, they backed down. They're like, wow, you're right. People do need help. No citations, nothing else. People need help. So, you know, we'll, we're going to lay off. You don't have to make anyone wear masks, they said to me. And they walked out. So praise the Lord, you know. And, and yeah. praise the Lord. We, we didn't have to do anything. Now, those are favorable cases. Well, what if they're saying, oh, well, we still don't like it. Put the cuffs on. You're under arrest or these other things. Well, if it's for the gospel, it's for the gospel. God is with you. Now, and that's what I was going to say is I remember before that meeting that was scheduled, with Vihan and the police, I remember thinking about this verse. <laughs> Don't think about what you're going to say. Ah, I would just fret. I'd be worried the whole time. Like, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? What, what do I do? What do I say? You know, like worry, anxiety, anxiety, worry. I was like, whoa, wait. Lord, you just told me what I say. I'm just going to... What I need more than anything is to be full of the Spirit. That's what I need. And, and that's what you need. And if we can just be full of the Spirit each day, then... Let the day happen. Whatever comes. And, and go into your day. Go into that meeting. And if you're full of spirit, good. If you're not, that's when problems are going to happen. Right? It's not our wisdom. It's not our eloquence. It's not our ability to defend ourselves and all this. So it's not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Now, brother is going to deliver a brother to death. Father is child. Children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Verse 21. Family members are going to hate you for sharing the gospel. Family members. And, and you'll be hated by all. Is this one on? You'll be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Amen. You're going to be hated by all kinds of people. People close to you. People distant from you. Jews. Gentiles. You'll be hated. For my name's sake. And he's forewarning his disciples. If they hated him and you're of him, they're going to hate you because you're of him. You get it? Yeah. The kingdoms of this world are opposed to the kingdom of heaven. And look what they did to him. Well, they're also going to hate and persecute those who come bearing his name, his message, his spirit into this world of darkness. 
Um, so a disciple's not above his master. And they, they, they had previously already called him Beelzebub, and the disciples were there during that clash. You know, he casts out demons by the prince of demons. Oh, really? Uh, that doesn't work. So he's helping people? Not, not satanic. Um, therefore, do not fear them. There's nothing, in verse 26, that encouragement. Yeah. There's nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. All the secret meetings or the ones they tell you about beforehand or the predictive programming they're putting out there and all this stuff, it's all going to be revealed. Praise the Lord. I don't have to reveal it myself. It's going to be revealed. What we reveal is the gospel. That's our job. And, and all, this, all the evil stuff that goes on in the world, all of the wickedness, it's going to be shown for what it is. A righteous judgment is coming. I cannot wait. I'm very excited for that. But think about this. We need to pray for governors and kings and people in power. There are people who are deceived. And there are people who, are, they're damned. And they're lost if they don't hear the gospel. So we pray for them. And they're, they're being used as absolute puppets. But a judgment day is coming. Justice will occur. True justice. And it always bugs me when I think about courts where justice doesn't occur in a court of justice. That is, that to me, is, that's, that drives me crazy. In a court of law, not a court of justice. Yeah. A court of injustice. Well, monkey trials, all that other stuff. This is a great verse for that, isn't it? And don't fear them. Jesus is like, I see it all. I know it all. Don't fear them. Fear gets the best of us. How about love them instead? Greater motivator than fear, by the way. So, don't fear. One day the secrets will be brought to light. And those things that were done in spirit and in truth, and people don't think that, that's going to be brought to light too. That was righteously done. You know, that guy was judged for this and it was righteous that he did that. It wasn't wrong. And the world judged him. That's going to be brought to light. So mountains will be brought down. Valleys will be lifted up. Jesus is sending the twelve with a message of the kingdom of heaven. He gives them their work. He gives them the forewarning of the opposition. And now in the rest of the chapter, he calls them to great boldness. He calls them to boldness. And I know in my life I've needed boldness and more boldness and, and continues. And it's by faith. That's how you're going to receive boldness, by faith. And, and uh, they were told to wait for the Spirit who would give them boldness. Uh, verse 27, whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light which you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. So that intimacy with Jesus, so needed. If you don't have intimacy with Jesus, you have no love to share. If you don't hear a word in your ear, if you're not spending time with Jesus, what are you going to share? Well, I'm going to share what I've been you know, consuming in mass media, of course. You know, like input, output. Well, how about increasing the input from the Lord, whatever I tell you. In those times where you're just alone in your closet, in the dark, what I tell you in the ear, what I speak to you and whisper in your ear, saying this is the way to go, walk in it. And, and spend time with the Lord. When you spend time with the Lord, you are going to be able to speak in the light. You're going to be able to herald from a rooftop truth in an opposing world. Wow. Now, we're not preaching just an ideology. We're not sharing another idea in the midst of all the isms out there. We're sharing the gospel, the truth. And it's very clear when you look at it all. So we get to that point. Arguing finer points of different things with people it usually isn't going to help. How about who is Jesus? Why did he come? What is God's plan? What happens when you die? Let's get to those points when we talk with people. And so time with the pers Lord personally will reflect publicly. Verse 28, don't fear again. 
those who kill, can kill the body or do kill the body but cannot kill the soul. See, our life is way more than just physical. Darwin is super wrong. Your life is more than a bag of chemicals. He's way off. You have a soul, you have a spirit that are so valuable. There's a body of the birds, there's a body of animals, there's a body of humans that's different. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that. We know that. Spirit, soul, body. And God is going to raise us up a glorious body. We're looking forward to that. But don't be afraid of those who can physically do damage to you or harm you is what he's saying. And that really is something where people want to, you know, ultimately we look for comforts. We look for physical comforts. We look for foods. We look for, you know, cozy places. We look for comforts all the time for our bodies. And we should learn as disciples not to let our body be the master of our life. And our spirit, we need to live through our bodies by our spirit, through our emotions by our spirit. And be led by the spirit, not living under the lusts of the flesh and of the body and the soul. So Jesus is calling his messengers not to fear what anyone can do to harm them or kill them physically. I mean, that's huge. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. They can't touch your soul. They can't kill the soul. But rather fear him who's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Incredible. There's the first death and the second death. You don't want to be part of the second. And then he assures them that he is aware. Aren't two sparrows sold for a copper coin and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. I don't know how many hairs are on my head. You know? But I, God does. I mean, He's assuring you that he knows, he cares about your body. He cares about your soul. He cares about your spirit. But there's an important mission at hand. Don't fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. Amen. God is sovereign. God knows what's going on in the spiritual, in the mental, and in the physical. God knows what's going on. And trust him. So our faith in the sovereign God should increase no matter what we're seeing physically with our eyes. We walk by faith and not by sight. So he is able to make all things right and will. And if, if, if it's God's will, I mean, Peter and John are asking the Lord, you know, was it uh, Peter asking the Lord, what's going to happen to John? What's going to happen to John when he dies? So that's not a, you don't need to know that. You know, it's not your business. You're going to die though, Peter. <laughs> So Peter's like, okay, if I get to give up my life for the Lord, I get to give up my physical life for the Lord. I get to receive a crown for that. His faith increased, increased. Our faith, can it grow more and more to the point where I'm like, I don't care anymore. My body, I don't live for it. I don't live so this body feels comfortable anymore. And, and, and yeah, enjoy life and use your body to the glory of God. But it's not master, it's not owner of all that are, happens in our will. So verse 32 and 33, he's again sharing basically speak publicly. Whoever confesses me before men, him I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. Whoever denies me before men, him I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. I wear a w wedding ring. And that shows, it's a public confession of my covenant bond with my wife. That's a public confession of my covenant bond with my wife. How about a public profession of my covenant bond with my Savior? And uh, I was in a, in a, I study in coffee shops often, not having an office or whatever, and, and I was in one the other day and uh, it was downtown preparing for this and it was probably one of the, just the wokest you know the most it was there and everybody walking in man it was just like wow and i was right by the tail because the place is packed i'm like and I, I didn't think twice about it but i remember thinking at one point yeah this bible's open 
it's there. And people are looking at it, and there's red letters everywhere, and it's a Bible. People don't carry these books around usually, right? And I've got my notepads, and I have another notepad, and I've got markers, and I'm sitting there, and I'm just at her. Well, maybe someone's going to see that. I guarantee a lot of people did, but my face is in it. But there's other times I'm at other places, and people, hey, you know, you're a believer? Don't be ashamed of Jesus. He loves you so much. He loves me so much. And what a shame it is if we're ashamed of him. May his love increase in our hearts. So publicly, don't hide the message of his kingdom. He's telling his apostles this. Verse 34, uh, all the way through to 39 here. Don't think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. This is a difficult verse. Yeah. Right? I thought he's the prince of peace. Isn't he coming to bring peace? And aren't we called? Blessed are the peacemakers. They should be called sons of God because we're like him. And a fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace. Well, what's he talking about? He didn't come to bring peace. Yes, ultimately he has come to bring peace. Of course he has come to bring peace. He is the Prince of Peace. But if he comes into a world of total darkness and he's the light of the world, something needs to happen. What does a sword do? It cuts, it slices, it divides. A sword divides. In Hebrews, we're told that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide between soul and spirit, what's of the flesh, what's of the spirit, able to divide even the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So a sword divides. And he says, I haven't come to set, I, for I have come to set a man against his father. How so? We're supposed to honor our father and our mother. So why would he come to set against that? He's not coming on purpose to uh, cause strife. No, no, no. He's coming on purpose to bring people to the light. And if a father chooses to go to the light and the son doesn't, well, now they're kind of divided. If a son goes to the light and the father doesn't, well, there's a division. God making us born again into his kingdom as a child of God. You're a new creation. No longer belonging to the old order of the sinful nature from Adam. A new creation in Christ. Of a new lineage, of a new family. And so there is a transferring from darkness into light. And that brings division. It's what's going to happen by default when people come to Christ. You know, if a Muslim in a fundamental Muslim community accepts Jesus, what do you think happens? Well, yeah, what do you think happens? They're going to publicly go proclaim that. Hey, I met Jesus this week. We came to be in a dream. This is great, you know? Okay, honor killing number, you know, 80,012 or whatever. By the way, what's happened in Yemen? What happens with the Muslims killing the Muslims like mad? And no one says, gas the Yemenites. And you can go on with some of that. Okay. I di- I, I'm diverging. Back to this. Uh, daughter against her mother. What an intimate relationship a daughter and a mother are supposed to have together. But Jesus is coming between that relationship. And that's why he's going to say... A man's enemies will be of those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. His point is that if you choose family affiliations and love more than the love of Christ and you say no to the gospel because you're choosing to remain in that family unit, then you're not worthy. You have to be willing to even let go of your dearest relationships for Jesus is the point. Jesus doesn't want to separate families. God created the family unit. And our city, our society is being torn apart because of the destruction of the understanding of the family unit. And so he's not against families, but Jesus... And his life, and his death, and his resurrection is going to bring a division between families. Those who are in Christ and those who are not in Christ. And it brings a great source of contention at times. Especially if you're from certain cultures or religions of strong beliefs. 
In a, in a culture where it's, you can believe anything you want, well, it's not that, as big of a deal. But it's, it's, it's becoming more impressed that you can't believe that. Oh, it's fine if you're, a, you know, this or that now. You can, you know, join the Masons, and you can go do this club, and you can go do that. But a Christian? You believe in Jesus? You go to church? Ooh. Repulsive. You know, like people really react because it's a spiritual reality. Because it's a spiritual truth that's happened. The division has cut something in two. I love what it says in Acts 26, 18, where Paul is recounting before governors that he was sent to bear the message. And so... I'll just read that one scripture to you in Acts 26. And he says, uh, recounts what the Lord told them to do as an apostle being sent out. And he says, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light. There's a division. Those who choose the light and they've left the darkness and they're not in kind of the darkness anymore. And from the power of Satan to God. Well, there's a division. Now you're not under the power of Satan anymore you're under the power of God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me so Paul knew he was going out with that word to people and how many people throughout the centuries have had to count dear costs for speaking the name of Jesus to even family members incredible many cultures when people turn to Jesus are disowned by their family and Jesus is saying then that's going to be the way it is if it's because of me he who finds uh, well in verse 38 he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me he who finds his life will lose it and he who loses his life for my sake will find it <clears throat> what a good is it if we gain the world and lose our soul, what good is it? What good is it if people love you and people like you and you die not knowing God and not being forgiven? What good is it? Yeah, you've kept your name intact. You were never defamed for the sake of Jesus. Any of these things. We need the bigger understanding. Taking up a cross. A cross? Yeah. An instrument that is your death. And Paul says he dies how often? Daily. Daily. He takes up this cross. But it's, you know, there's no resurrected life without the crucified one. And if you have nothing to die for, you have nothing to live for. And Christians need to, we need to learn the, the, the crucified life is the happy life, by the way. No, I want my best life now. How about your best life later, but a really good one now, when you choose Jesus and, and walk in Him? <laughs> so I, I uh, take up your cross. I am so liberated when I choose to deny myself and serve others and give rather than take and selflessly love. I'm liberated from my tyrannical flesh that always wants to ruin my day. So take up your cross daily. Follow after me. Jesus knows the way to go. He finds his life, loses it, and he loses it for my sake, will find it. What a promise. What a promise. No one can take it from you. Eternal life in him. And so all of this opposition requires much boldness. And we get boldness by knowing he's the way, the truth, and the life. And, and ultimately, verse 40 to 42, some people are going to receive, uh, or did not receive, is, is 34 to 39. Verse 40 to 42, the encouragement is some people will. He who receives you receives me. He receives me, receives him who sent me. He receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. He receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man. Hey, we come here bearing the name of Jesus, the righteous one. We come here telling you about the, and if you, they receive, then there's rewards for that. There's blessings for that. And just even giving a child a cup of cold water in his name. I come here in the name of Jesus. I give this to you in the name of Jesus. The Lord knows that. And that's credited to a heavenly account. Assuredly, I say to you, you shall no, by no means lose his reward. It's not unto salvation, 
It's because of salvation. We're working out our salvation. It happens to go out because the love of Christ is in our hearts. And love will compel you to do some crazy things. And the world will wonder what is going on with you. So the mission of sharing the message of his king and kingdom and sharing the gospel is really needed in the world. We need to awaken to that. Pray for laborers, workers, and the harvest. Where's the harvest? Everywhere. And pray for that. And as you pray, your heart changes. As you, as you spend time with the Lord, then you have something to give. You spent time at a well and a beautiful water, uh, the, the life-giving water, and I have something to give. Come see a man who told me everything. Do you see that there is a harvest that's ready? Do you see that there is a lot of work to do and there are workers needed? Do you know there will be opposition because it's a kingdom war that we are in? <clears throat> do you trust the Lord? That he's given you his spirit and he will give you boldness. He will give you words when you need them. He will give you provision when you need it. And he will protect you. Amen. Psalm 121. That was a good psalm we read. Is that my phone? <laughs> Jesus prepares them. And we are to know this ahead of going out. So, by the way, in closing, the apostello, apostle, the idea of that is literally sent out. And it's to send forth. I'm apostling you. It's a verb in this case. So they became the apostles. Now, from the verb. Okay? So their, their mo motion is being sent forth. And literally in the term apostello is to send at liberty. Interesting. To be at freedom. To set at liberty. If you took a bird out of a cage and you let it go, you have apostello, that bird. You have set it at liberty. That's interesting. We are not controlled or forced. We're not under condemnation. We're not under law. We're under grace. We are not manipulated into going out for Jesus. Go or else. God could put that recorder in the sky and play the gospel out to everyone. He chooses to use us. God puts skin on. And he's still sending us out incarnationally to a world that needs to see people who know Jesus. People who have been confronted by the love of God. Changed by the love of God. And the aroma of Christ goes out. And it's an aroma of death to some and life to others. I want that. There's something different. So the sending is itself a liberty. Those in Christ are freed, and it is for freedom that he has set us free. We are not in bondage, which is why we have a message of freedom from bondage. We who are healed get to go help people be healed. We who have received truth get to go share truth. We who have received life from Jesus get to go share life with others. Fear will bind you up. He has not given you a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and a sound mind, a clear head. Who better to tell others than those who themselves have been freed by our loving Savior? Lord Jesus, we want to trust you. We thank you that you have come into this dark world on that great rescue mission, that you are the bridge to life, that you laid down your life and rose again from the dead, that you have given us freedom from sin, you've given us freedom from law, you've given us freedom from ourselves and from the old nature, and you've given us your Holy Spirit, a new nature. We wanna grow. We want to understand where we belong and whom we belong to. We want to live out your will for us. We're done with living our way. Now we confess you are the way. We're done with lies. 
and now we're in the truth. Jesus, thank you for not only liberating us, but now giving us a mission and a purpose in this world. And we want to be part of it in whatever way we can be a part of it. And Lord, I know that as we just love you each day, spend time with you, it'll supernaturally, naturally just happen in our lives. We get to grow in Christ likeness. We get to share that aroma of Christ where we go. Lord, this isn't something we can sh you know, strive to put on the outer man and force ourselves to do. So we pray for my life to change, our hearts to change, and then it is in spending time with you and it exudes out to others around us. We pray that you would help us to declare the good news in the location we're at and the time that we have to do it. And Lord, we pray for workers and labors for your harvest. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.